Hey, Cypher here, and today I've got quite an interesting film review. 24th is about the 1917 Houston Mutiny. It's an incredibly difficult topic to cover, and it was released at an incredibly awkward time. Yet, I think they really managed to nail it. Some of you may not know that I'm working on my dissertation, and it's about violence in the Southwest. Now, Houston is not the Southwest, it's the South, and that's an incredibly important distinction for the topic. But what I do cover is Buffalo Soldiers serving in Arizona a year later. Buffalo Soldiers were black troops in the US Army. There are many definitions, but here I am referring to four specific units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, as well as the 24th and 25th Infantry who all formed in 1866 and would serve until after World War II when the army desegregated. For the most part, they had white officers, though there's a few exceptions. I'm researching the Battle of Ambos Nogales, which 10th Cavalrymen were participants in, and were partially there because of what happened in Houston. As such, the topics are incredibly linked and in a way that the movie actually doesn't touch on. So let's talk about the bigger picture of Buffalo Soldiers along the border during World War I. In 1915, an insurrection arose in southern Texas. Raiders from Mexico destroyed infrastructure, depredated cattle, and killed military, law enforcement, and civilians alike. Turns out, this was part of a half-baked scheme to take Texas and the Southwest called the Plan de San Diego. It said, We shall proclaim them an independent republic, later requesting, if it be thought expedient, annexation to Mexico. Prisoners shall be shot immediately without any pretext. Every stranger who shall be found armed, and who cannot prove his right to carry arms, shall be summarily executed, regardless of his race or nationality. Every North American over 16 years of age shall be put to death. Obviously, this scared Texans. Rangers and vigilantes ruthlessly targeted Mexicans and Tejanos in the Nueces Strip area to prevent these so-called bandits. While the Plan's insurrectionaries, also known as seditiosos because they sought sedition, certainly did some heinous things, including flaying some prisoners alive, Texans massacred more civilians. Seditiosos killed less than 20 Americans, but there were as many as 300 Hispanics dead at the hands of Americans. This led to a lot of soldiers garrisoning the border, including Buffalo soldiers. Some had already been there because of the Mexican Revolution, or previous incidents like the various Maganista fights beforehand. It was likely Maganistas who wrote the Plan de San Diego in the first place, so they were quite an issue. Though it should be pointed out that constitutionalist forces under Carranza had quite a history of supporting the Plan de San Diego. But it was concerns over Maganistas that brought black soldiers to Brownsville in 1906, where there was a shooting there and the Buffalo Soldiers were blamed, leading President Teddy Roosevelt to dishonorably discharge them because they were supposedly not being forthright about the shooting, despite the fact that there wasn't enough proof of them doing it. Nonetheless, the Bandit War was a significant escalation in 1915. This was during heightened Jim Crow laws, which reached their nadir during Wilson's presidency. So racial tensions were extraordinarily strange and fraught when the Bandit War began. Some Buffalo soldiers manned a post in Columbus, New Mexico, and they got attacked. Pancho Villa had steadily turned against the U.S. over 1915 and decided to terrorize the border. This launched a mission to prevent further attacks under Black Jack Pershing, so nicknamed because he was especially friendly with black men under his command. Either way, they were incredible soldiers, despite the regular prejudice and discrimination against them. Hence why old Black Jack happily took many on his punitive expedition. The still very new National Guard mobilized for the first time to take up the slack along the border. Tensions with the Constitutionalist government of Mexico were high with so many U.S. soldiers invading. The Guard had to stop possible Plan de San Diego bandits, via Istas, and maybe a full-scale Mexican invasion. Even as that atmosphere cooled and Pershing withdrew to the border, Germany during World War I saw an opportunity. Their Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Arthur Zimmerman, sent off a witless proposal that Mexico could go and invade to take back the Southwest and Texas, just like the plan had said. 
They'd start up unrestricted submarine warfare and aid Mexico in their invasion. It was idiotic, but the sub-attacks were real. So the US declared war on Germany. Now it was time to train up and mobilize. With the 24th still in Columbus, C Battalion was sent to Houston to protect a new facility built there called Camp Logan. It was to train up local Texans to mobilize to the Western Front. Because of the rise in new factories for war, Industrial jobs became incredibly contentious, especially when black people worked what whites saw as their potential jobs. Whites in East St. Louis and Chester, Pennsylvania attacked black residents. It was particularly bad in East St. Louis, where they forcibly evacuated the entire black population. It was one of the worst race riots in U.S. history. 55 to 160 died in both of these. Considering Wilson had framed the war in April saying, The world must be made safe for democracy it would seem that part of the war effort would require prosecuting the perpetrators of such violence. But Wilson was thoroughly unsympathetic and did nothing despite coining the phrase fighting for democracy. So, with the heightened racial tensions headed by a cruel commander-in-chief, the 24th was poised for disaster. Houston police regularly harassed Buffalo soldiers, especially if they seemed at all uppity. Maintaining white supremacy was more important than honoring soldiers' service. Two Houston PD officers chased a few black civilians for some crime. They barged into a black woman's house, and when she denied knowing the fugitives, they arrested her. An infantryman asked to take her into custody, but one policeman savagely pistol-whipped him instead. With such marked cruelty, the leader of the local military police for the 24th, Charles Baltimore, tried to prevent the arrest and got hit himself, and while he was trying to run away, they shot at him. Word made it back to Camp Logan that HPD killed both of these men, though they had actually survived. Worse still, a rumor of a white mob coming to attack them filtered through camp. After East St. Louis only a month prior, they were somewhat justified in that belief. Soldiers started arming themselves, which did not bode well. The new post commander hadn't made a good rapport with his troops, and so when he called the battalion to formation for disarmament, they weren't quite willing to follow him. Someone shot off a pistol, which stoked the erroneous belief that the camp was under attack. Camp guards fired indiscriminately in defense. A first sergeant used the commotion to arm his men. They decided to attack HPD. About 150 soldiers marched toward downtown. The mutiny began. They killed the first police officer who crossed their path. But then the shooting became general. All discipline among the mutineers was lost. They shot everywhere, especially Jim Crow signs. Eventually, they started killing civilians. Though they killed five police officers, including one of the two known to have attacked Corporal Baltimore, they killed another 11 Houstonians, including a woman. But what truly stopped the mutiny was when some Illinois National Guardsmen tried to negotiate. Probably mistakenly, the mutineers killed all four of them. Though these same guardsmen had supposedly initially joined the East St. Louis riot, they were responsible for halting the killing back in July. The mutineers were heartbroken by their unnecessary deaths, so they broke up. Most mutineers made it back to camp, but some hid around town. National Guardsmen and HPD hunted them down, killing one in the process. Camp Logan got locked down, and the alleged participants rooted out. This was slapdash at best. In the middle of the night, a roll call of bunks was the basis for arrest. If they weren't in their barracks or tents, they were arrested. Problem is, soldiers could have been in the latrine or on the makeshift defenses against the rumored white mob. The army held a court-martial in San Antonio fairly quickly afterwards. A couple mutineers testified with immunity agreements, highlighting the remaining ringleaders. That first sergeant who led the march committed suicide on the way back. More than 150 Houstonians testified, but none could identify any of the perpetrators. The 13 ringleaders were quickly and secretly executed, causing quite the commotion over civil rights. The NAACP lamented, They have gone to their death, 13 young, strong men, soldiers who have fought for a country which was never wholly theirs. After a year of further investigation and two more trials, the army executed another six. Loads were left to rot in prison. After all that, any Buffalo soldiers were distrusted. Wilson, in particular, wasn't willing to send them across the Atlantic. They all stayed stateside during World War I, though many veterans transferred to other colored units in France. That's why the 10th was in Nogales in 1918. The 25th arrived just a few days too late to join in the Battle of Ambos Nogales. 
The Camp Logan mutiny was enough to demote these incredibly important and well-performing units. They served their country well, yet because of a single mutiny, they were judged as the rest, never able to rise above Jim Crow, to the everlasting dishonor of the United States. From the earliest reporting on the Camp Logan mutiny, journalists were surprisingly ambivalent. Local newspapers used this to bolster popularity for further Jim Crow measures, while Northerners typically spoke of the mutiny being brought on by Houstonian bigotry. None excused the mutineers, but most explained their rage with the rampant racism. This ambivalence continued once historians began writing on the incident, and continues well into the present. Save for the most blatantly ignorant, we cannot help but sympathize with the plight of Buffalo soldiers while refusing to condone that night's massacre. But that is a very difficult line to walk. While primary filming for this movie took place in 2019, it was released in August of 2020, at the height of the racial unrest of that year. Many at the time, and I'm sure there will be plenty in the comments, not only supported the riots, but celebrated them. Activists have likewise tried to excuse the mutineers over the years. Condoning massacres is unfortunately no longer beyond the political pale, which of course has caused much violence in our times. So much like scholars on this, this movie had to trek across that tightrope of explanation without excuse. Given the atmosphere it came out in, I was surprised how well it managed to maintain ambiguity. They don't have much to go off of for most of the film. Microfilm post-returns end in 1917, so you'd have to go to the National Archives to even find that. Otherwise, the trial documents and newspaper accounts are digitally available, but are necessarily biased against the mutineers. So scholars and the movie have limited primary sources to work with, which I think they did pretty well. A lot of this movie is fictionalized, and perhaps necessarily so. The primary cast have similar names to their real-life counterparts. For instance, the main character is called Boston instead of Baltimore. I'm fine with fictionalizing real names, and this probably allows the filmmakers to avoid the scrutiny of their descendants. There isn't much info on what these men did on a day-to-day -day basis, so they fill the film in with good character development, which allows for explaining a lot of the racial dynamics of the time. We see a lot of everyday abuses Buffalo soldiers in Houston faced. Move behind the screen. There ain't no role, man. I'm a soldier in the U.S. Army. I sit where I want to sit. Oh. My apologies, there's no sign. Drink your own kind's water. Well, where's my kind's water? <clears throat> Only somebody you're gonna be pissing on today, boy. They had to face the full brunt of Jim Crow. Jim Crow's the law. Respect it. Things are a little different down here in the South. From now on, I will expect you men to obey the racial code. In the process of this, we are constantly reminded of previous outrages, especially racial massacres that affected many soldiers even before they joined. He died in Atlanta in 1906. In riots? Yeah. Right after it, I went right home to uh, East St. Louis. The whole neighborhood uh, looked like Admiral Dewey even blowed it up. They talk about how Teddy Roosevelt got all the credit for taking San Juan Hill in Cuba, and how that affected Buffalo soldiers at the time. I got it moving up San Juan Hill, alongside Teddy Roosevelt. In the end, there was our dead black bodies on the ground. And that lying son of a bitch sailed off to the White House and took our credit. They even mention David Fagan, the Buffalo soldier who deserted to join insurrectionaries in the Philippines. Who? Fagan. That black mother could have deserted and joined the Filipino army fought against his own damn country and us. That is all some deep world building, so you come to understand the world these men lived in. The lead up to the mutiny is fairly accurate as well. We see the dispute over an arrest, leading to Baltimore having to run. 
Then there's the rumor of a white mob in subsequent arming up and marching on Houston. We see some of the atrocities committed during their rampage. And it finally ends with the trial, which is picture perfect with the real deal. Suffice it to say, this is a good film, but it inevitably omits some important details. I am a man. I'm a man. I am a man. I am a man. First and foremost, as with any film about the military, they cannot gather enough men to depict the full force. The battalion sent to guard Camp Logan was over 800 soldiers strong. We only see a few dozen. When they attack Houston, we see this small contingent. In reality, there were between 100 and 150 of them. There are some problems with this depiction, too. For instance, they show a soldier attacking the police in the middle of their wrongful arrest. He simply argued with officers, and they attacked him, not the other way around. Then there's the cleanup after the massacre. They omit the sometimes brutal manner many of the mutineers were hunted down. These things kinda show the movie as being somewhat unsympathetic to the mutineers, but it's likely that they simply didn't want to get into every detail. There's a minor detail this gets wrong that I've gotta point out. It makes a big deal about Buffalo soldiers trying to prove themselves worthy of being deployed to World War I. Kind of say we going to France. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we going to France. Uh-huh. That's why we out here digging the shit in, huh? Stop the 24th head honor. You can find the Philippines, but not France. Well, the specific regiments that made these units remain stateside, mostly protecting the border from further Pancho Villa and Plan de San Diego raids, many Buffalo Soldier veterans did deploy nonetheless, just in different units. They needed to spread out among the new recruits to lend their expertise. So this is a misconception the movie's pushing. Also, the Major wasn't shot at at the beginning of the mutiny. They simply fired a few rounds in formation at nothing. These are pretty minor and do not affect the narrative. They manage to cover the extremely difficult topic surprisingly well. In a time of such strife, this could have been a particularly damaging film. It's too bad that the pandemic meant that the box office was pretty limited, but at least it's easy to find. So check out the 24th. Morning. Say hi. <laughs> Say hi. Oh, thank you. You're a good boy. Yes. And look, it's a t-shirt with you on it. <laughs> <laughs>